Tech Reimagined. Redefining the relationship between people and technology. Brought to you by Andava. This is Tech Reimagined. Hello, I'm Bradley Howard and welcome to Tech Reimagined, a place where we get technology experts together to explore innovative ways to reimagine the relationship between people and technology as it relates to things that influence our everyday lives. Today, I have two experts from the mobility industry, Tony Whitehorn and Adam Banks. Tony, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Tony Whitehorn. Uh, I've been in the automotive industry for well over 30 years, goodness me. And uh, more recently, um, I was uh, president and CEO for Hyundai Motor Company um, here in the UK and parts of Europe. Uh, and uh, I stepped down uh, back in sort of the middle of 2019 and now set up my consultancy. And I'm involved in many things in, in boards uh, with regard to mobility. Hi, I'm Adam, currently a non-exec director on a number of fintech and financial type companies. Um, here, though more because of my background, I was CTIO, which is Chief Technology and Information Officer for AP Mollemersk, the world's largest shipping company. And prior to that, I was Chief Technology Officer and Chief Information Officer for Visa. We're hearing a lot about mobility at the moment. I'd like to start by sharing our definition of what mobility is all about. It's that which enables people and goods to traverse the landscape of the physical world faster, more efficiently and with more granularity than is currently available today. Tony, how does that resonate with you? Yeah, I think what's really interesting about mobility is that it really is, it sort of encompasses so many things nowadays. Um, that's a good thing and a bad thing. And I think um, what therefore happens is that it's, it becomes a little bit nebulous to some people. Um, but it does enable more and more sectors and more and more industries to enter a space that historically has probably been dominated by the likes of the automotive industry, to be honest. So uh, things like payments, for example, we hear a lot about how transport is facilitating payments, especially on underground and metro environments and driving the adoption of um, contactless payments. Yeah, I mean, historically, you'd never have thought that, let's say, Visa or anybody like that would be in the mobility uh, space. Um, but as per your previous definition, enabling people and goods to move in a seamless way, to enable that to happen, you have to have something like payments Therefore, it becomes frictionless. So on that basis, you're drawing in uh, different industries that previously would never have considered them to be in, in that mobility arena. And do you think that's one of the reasons we're seeing such acceleration of new companies coming into the fold, like Tesla, for example, with a market cap that surpasses almost every other vehicle manufacturer? Yeah, I, th I think that... Um, what, what historically has happened, as with many industries, is you have this silo mentality. They so say, yeah, I am in the automotive industry. I am in the freight and logistics industry. And by virtue of connectivity, uh, those barriers have been broken down. And I don't think that that has ever really happened before. So we're, we are at, uh, at the vanguard of something that is changing quite dramatically and in a, a brand new space. I think there's a, an interesting point there around for want of a better word, base technology capability. So be it connectivity, be it type of devices, be it battery life, those kind of things are really starting to open up industries that previously couldn't be digitised because they were physical to digitisation because you can connect the physical to the digital. That's really interesting, isn't it? So we've been hearing a lot about the term mobility as a service and how it will be powered by 5G. Adam, do you think that this is another industry buzzword or does it have some genuine meaning? Depends which one you're talking about. <laughs> if it's 5G, then I do think that certainly for good, goods mobility is going to have a significant impact. Data volumes in that area are tiny. They always have been. They're constrained by satellites. So, so the sort of 5G bandwidth is nothing but hype. It's the low latency aspect. When, when you look at, if I just take Maersk as an example, there's 4 million containers con in continuous movement around the world. Trying to understand every single data point, where it is, what's happening to it, the amount of shock it's been through, temperature pressure inside a container on a continual basis requires a very, very chatty interface. And that's what 5G is going to enable at a different lower level of granularity than we've ever had before. So there's 4 million containers. Um, how do you think that will affect things like the airline industry then, for example, where you've got um, aeroplanes all over the world, all now wanting to be tracked? 
Yeah, so I mean, that, that kind of capability has been there for a long time. If you think about a plane, it's got an almost unlimited power source. It's got a huge amount of assets strapped to it. It's when you go to the other extreme and say a pair of jeans or a small cardboard box, how do you track a cardboard box? It's got no power connectivity to it. It's got no network connectivity. The kind of technology we're seeing today enables you to do exactly that. So mesh networks that are pretty much powerless, RFID type networks, those kind of things connected to, let's say, the container that they're in, the container broadcasting to the ship or the truck that it's on, the truck broadcasting to the... Net, that's the kind of insight you can get. And then companies and customers are going to be able to choose to prioritise goods in transit. And that's a complete game changer. So between Adam and Tony, we've heard almost the B2C type approach um, that Tony was describing with, with basically cars. Um, and Adam, you were describing much more of a B2B type environment of um, not just looking at the container, but the goods inside the container and, and the um, environment in the container, um, which I'd never thought of before. But do you think there are also the adjacent industry links with B2B tracking of, of containers and the items? Absolutely. I mean, if, if I offered Tony the opportunity to have a factory that never ran out of stock, because he could prioritise the gearboxes over the dashboards or whatever it was that was coming in. That would be a hugely attractive proposition. Cost of goods, so physical transit costs are almost zero. So to put some real numbers on it, the cost of shipping all of the raw materials into Japan or to China to make a pair of Nike trainers and ship the trainers from China back into Europe is 25 US cents per pair of trainers. If you think of the value of actually getting the right goods to the right place on time, the value is massively higher than the current cost, and that's the opportunity we'll see through integrating the edges of supply businesses and demand businesses so that it becomes, in essence, a single virtual business, although with two separate P&Ls and two separate focuses. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, Adam says, because um, I think Toyota were at the leading edge of lean production, and uh, and their whole thing was don't have too much stock lying around and uh, that was really done on a I was going to say on a hydraulic type of basis but with connectivity that now has spread into just about every manufacturing plant whether it be cars whether it be um, trainers whatever it happens to be and connectivity and IT has enabled everybody to embrace that lean production syndrome. Is it Toyota and in your case Adam Maersk are they providing the connectivity and the integration between the different... Well, I think that's the next step. So the connectivity we're talking about now is sort of connectivity within a business. Where we're going to get to in the next phase is connectivity across businesses. So that, for example, as the primary carrier for BMW, Maersk, for example, would be aware of the stock levels within BMW of certain items and can prioritise containers in their flow to make sure that that stock is kept at a suitable level. Thinking about the future and automated cars, how do you think that's going to affect the overall industry? Tony? Yeah, um, there's a lot of hype about um, automation of vehicles. Uh, I'll be really honest with you. Uh, it, it, if you have a look at the car today, um, the level of automation is graded uh, from one to five. Uh, one is essentially no level of automation and five is no steering wheel uh, we are today and if you think about cruise control you think about um, radar you think about um, lane keep assist so there's a, it seems well, there's a serious amount of automation in the car we're at level two so going from level two to level five is a massive, massive step. In 2016, there was some incredible hype about everybody going, oh, yeah, we'll have automated cars, it'll be amazing, and Waymo came along, and, and guess what? Even the CEO of Waymo says, I will never see automated cars in my lifetime. Automated cars, complete automation of vehicles, uh, will not happen until, my belief, about 2050. So we are talking a serious length of time. So will it change? Um... I think that what's going on in the industry itself is that uh, the, the car industry has got other priorities, electrification, connectivity, 
are far, far more important for them than levels of automation. Uh, and so, therefore, they're concentrating on, on those two aspects. So I think that it's a, it's a great headline, automation, um, but from my perspective, I don't think it's something around the corner. Um, yes, uh, the companies are using it at the moment for safety aspects. Of course they are. Uh, but to be really honest, uh, there's other priorities in the automotive industry. And you mentioned about the powertrain in cars at the moment. Um, so in the UK, here we are, um, the government has announced that we're going to not have any uh, fuel in cars in 15 years' time. How do you feel about that? OK, so I'm going to be a bit um, uh, provocative here uh, because uh, what's happened is that the world has jumped on the EV bandwagon. And if you look at... Um, from well to wheel, which is the whole production cycle of a, an EV vehicle. If you compared an EV vehicle to the exact same diesel vehicle, the EV vehicle would have to have driven 60,000 miles before it comes exactly the same level as CO2 as the diesel vehicle because in the production of an EV vehicle the level of CO2 is enormous. So yes it's wonderful when people say oh I've got a zero emitting vehicle um, but you have to look at the whole production cycle of it. Uh, don't get me wrong if we can get uh, zero emission um, in terms of levels of production for the e for the battery then great that's really good news but we're nowhere near that at this moment in time. So I think that EV has, has some legs. Um, it is not the panacea. Uh, I think that many people, to be honest, would be more suited to driving a diesel vehicle today, which is you don't hear that from anybody else, I have to say. Um, but it's been painted as a very black picture. Uh, but to be really honest, if you're doing 30, 40,000 miles a year, you should be driving a diesel vehicle. You should not be driving an EV. Uh, particularly if you do long journeys, it, it's just uh, in it, it's overall it's it doesn't suit. It's inefficient for people's lifestyle. Absolutely. Can I ask um, what's you, the main vehicles in your households then, Adam? I'd really rather you didn't ask that question. He's <laughs> got a bike, probably. <laughs> no, I'm the other end of the scale when it comes to energy consumption. I'm afraid. I, I work on the basis that. You're as green as you can be based on the numbers of litres of engine you leave on the drive when you go to work. <laughs> so I have quite a few large capacity engines, but they sit there most of the time, so that's OK. That's interesting, because that, that brings us on to ownership. In fact, before we move on to ownership, what's the, what's the main vehicle in your household? Tony? Yeah, so I have to. I have a hybrid vehicle and a petrol vehicle. Right, OK. So um, let's, let's talk about ownership, as you were just saying, Adam. So as part of Endava's 20th birthday... Our chief exec, John Cottrell, was asked in an interview about future trends. And he specifically called out the automotive industry. And he said, only one in 20 cars are being used at any one time. The rest are sitting in car parks and garages. So once autonomous cars become more widely available, people won't need 95% of the cars they need today. And we've already talked about automated cars, but the ownership point is really interesting. If only one in 20 cars of uh, being used at any one time, why do we need so many cars? I think there's an interesting societal point there as well. Um, everyone immediately looks at the benefits of, well, you know, 5% of the cars there are today, much higher utilisation, much more efficiency. I spend most quality time with my kids driving them somewhere. Now, in a fully autonomous world, they're doing that by themselves. And, and I, I definitely would miss time with my son on the way to sports and my daughter on the way to music, because that it literally is probably eight to ten hours a week. That's really interesting. Um, Tony? Yeah, I think let, let's put autonomous cars to one side because they're in the future. They're, they're somewhere away. I think between now, let's say between now and 2050, what's going to happen? Um, we only drive our cars 5% of the time. 95% of the time, the car is stationary. Where's your car now? It's in a car park. It's somewhere else. It's not being used. And when people say, oh, do you use I use my car a lot. Think about the time, you know, of, of use of your car. Yes, I think you never, ever think about when you're not using your car. And yet it's not used 95% of the, of the time that you have it. So as society moves on and people look at sustainability, we have to look at a more efficient way of utilising that asset. So I am a big believer uh, in, in car sharing of some form. Now, car sharing doesn't work if you are commuting. Uh, 
Um, I totally understand that. But in terms of second cars, is there something that you can be... Ut- I mean, most people have... So an awful lot of people have two cars. There has to become some sort of car-sharing uh, situation that is a viable prospect. And I don't just mean hourly rental. There is something like fractional ownership, which would be very interesting. Because, let's be honest, um, you wouldn't have thought that uh, 20 years ago that... Um, uh, the all those wonderful CD player, CD discs that you had in your lounge, all stacked up and everybody looked at, would actually be completely useless now as Spotify comes in. It's a subscription model. Same with Netflix. There has to be something else in terms of the utilisation of the asset that we have today in a more efficient way. And that, to me, is a subscription model on cars. That's, I believe, what's going to bridge between now and the autonomous cars. So I ride my bike through uh, through central London most days um, as I commute to to work, and um, I, I pass several bays that are part of these subscription models. But it still feels not very many, even in the middle of central London. Why why are they not taking off? Do you think back to Adam's point that it's quite cultural that we want to own cars? Well, so I'll chip in with a Copenhagen perspective here, having spent the last five years living in Copenhagen. Two things are very apparent. One, the bicycle is king. I mean, the, the, the bike has right of way over cars. So it, if you're in the UK, when you come to turn left in a car, it has to wait for the bikes into Copenhagen. So, so there is a massive amount of cycling. Something like 99% of Danes cycle weekly. The other is that there's a very large usage of car share schemes. Um, the main reason for that is parking charges. So parking charges outside your house are £35 a day. Unless you have specific land you own, which in the city you know, is fairly rare, any form of parking is about £35 a day. Therefore, the hourly model becomes highly attractive. I mean, I was five years out there, didn't have a car. Yeah, I think as well that society is changing. Historically, we as society have been about um, ownership. That's what we have been you know, we own our houses we own cars that's you know the the, the, the castle is you know that's what we have been brought up with um the millennials coming through they're more about usage they don't care about ownership you know there's so many more rented um places that are out there today which was never something that i was brought up with but today that's exactly what my kids are doing uh, so on that basis that idea of ownership saying why should i own it actually i just want to use it and that, therefore, is a different psyche to those, those people who are coming through. And on that basis, if you think about usage and not ownership, and this isn't a great thing for the car manufacturers because they're going to see um, n- not as many people buying cars because people are going to be sharing them. You know, the three of us, actually, we could be starting to share cars. Um, so I do think that there's a model that is changing and that is something as well that is happening with our culture as well as a need for sustainability and wastage. It's ridiculous. You, dr- you go down a road in London and you can hardly get down it. Why? Because of all the cars parked. Yeah, so I uh, I had a great conversation with my brother-in-law a couple of years ago. So I've got a 17-year-old son, and um, we worked out how much we could give him um, as Uber vouchers rather than putting him through driving lessons, the test, buying a, a small car, and insuring it in, in the first couple of years. And it was several thousand pounds, but it just doesn't feel the same kind of return if we just said, Here, here's a whole load of money for you to go and spend on Uber. Um, so maybe there needs to be that cultural change. Are you suggesting that with more um, uh, flats renting, but also more subscription models across things like Netflix, Spotify, etc., it will just become natural to rent a car as you need it on on that need basis i think there's something definitely in that in that culturally we are moving on um and uh, when you start to look at the asset that is not used 95 percent of your time you're going why have i got this there must be some sort of opportunity whereby the three of us could with the appropriate app share this vehicle shouldn't we not necessarily as my primary vehicle but my secondary vehicle shouldn't we be sharing this much better, much more effective in terms of um, wastage uh, and sustainability. So, Tony, while you were chairman of Hyundai UK, um, you saw a big change in um, customers wanting to buy the car to higher purchase and other different forms of of, um, of owning that car. Um, 
how long do you think it'll be before we start seeing real mass change and a migration into more, more of a subscription model? Yeah, my view is that is around the corner. Um, if you look in central London, great situation whereby uh, you have a number of people who, number of developers who are building flats, and when they're building uh, apartments, uh, they have a restricted number of of, um, of parking spaces. Uh, and of course, from their point of view, they don't want that many parking spaces because for each parking space, they could put another apartment. So from their side, it's good. Um, Great London Council as well. So they're also saying, oh, we also don't really want to have too many parking spaces because we want to cut down on congestion. So there has to be something there whereby this block of apartments could start to share vehicles. Um, in a restricted number of parking spaces with all those people who actually own those. So I, I, it's my belief is it is coming. Are we going to see the auto manufacturers step up? I mean, if you think of that model, it would be great to have three small cars, one medium, one large and a van. <laughs> where, where are the auto manufacturers in rocking up and saying, hey, we'll be part of this as a partner? Yeah, so um, from my knowledge, I absolutely know that that's where the auto manufacturers uh, really can see things happening there's um there's a in the automotive uh, situation there's a it's called case case so it's connectivity autonomous cars sharing and electrification so the, that's case and it's the the s which doesn't require lots and lots of investment it requires a cultural change um an innovative move uh, and that's where automotive manufacturers are saying we need to get into bed with people who are into the sharing model because really uh, big conglomerates like toyota hyundai bmw they're not agile enough to get into that but they're partnering now with people who actually can develop sharing sharing models so putting the last two parts of the conversation together where we talked about um, autonomous vehicles and also car ownership, um, we're already seeing a decline in car sales uh, across, um, certainly in the UK. The SMMT announced that earlier this, this week. Um, but if we, uh, if we suddenly start finding that the number of cars being sold declines because of more subscription models... Do you think we'll then see less investment into autonomous cars as well? So it become kind of ever decreasing circles. Um, I know that you're saying that autonomous vehicles are probably still a way off, but will that be even further away if there'll be less investment there? Uh, I believe that's true. Um, car manufacturers are not making as much money as they used to uh, because they're having to invest in great levels of technology and particularly electrification. Uh, nobody makes money out of electric vehicles. <laughs> uh, manufacturers, dealers... Um, intermediaries it's it's uh, there's there's very little profit in um in fact no profit really in electrified vehicles at the moment this moment in time whereas historically with a a, a normal internal combustion engine vehicle there was lots of profit in that so therefore the manufacturers are saying where am i going to get my money from to invest in the future they are looking to survive as at today and that's an issue for them so it's interesting that we talked about the profitability of the car manufacturers um, are moving back to mobility as a service. Companies like Uber, Lyft and so forth as well. Um, they're also announcing that they're struggling to make some profits as well. And in fact, Uber have said that the way that it is going to generate some profit is through its sideline businesses like food delivery, etc., rather than the transportation of people. Any comments on that? Yeah, actually, I'm interested from Adam's point of view because... Uh, you know, is it very much in the logistics? Are logistics is logistics now very profitable? No. So, so logistics is more of a commodity industry than you'd like to think. I mean, there's brokers in logistics, typically called freight forwarders, who are the commercially astute folks that are buying and selling space. I mean, they don't own any assets; they're just buying and selling space on assets or buying and selling rental of containers. The margins there are reasonable. But if you look at the asset owners, the people that own the ports, the ships, um, the containers, roughly speaking, over 10 years, return on invested capital has been down in the sort of 2%, 3%. Oh, gosh. So, I mean, if it was your money, you'd leave it in the bank type scenario. They're mostly family-owned businesses, have been for generations, which is what keeps people there. So I think that industry has to look for a, another opportunity, which is where, I say, seamless logistics, where manufacturing and consumption is tied together, through real understanding of what's going on at stock levels within both ends of the chain is where potential logistics can play a, a more important role. Mm. I mean, if you think, we'll go back to our Nike trainers example. 
25 cents to ship it. Just think of the labour arbitrage. You've, all of that profit pool has been given away to the end customers in there. So that there needs to be a way of thinking about physical flow smarter, and that's what some of the logistics companies are starting to get into now. It's possible, for example, on a, a large boat. Um, one of our big boats carries 23,000 containers. If you're the last loaded and the first off, you're four days quicker in transit than being the last sort of first on and last off. That's not monetized today in shipping. Why would you not create an express sort of model? Equally the same way a, a computer network, an IP network works. You have sort of dynamic routing of IP packets. Well, that could be the same for physical goods. You could dynamically route stuff across the network. Challenging part today is, of course, that means going through different countries, which means different paperwork, which means different clearances. So, so if you know, if you dynamically routed it, but there's no reason when now we've got this granularity of information that you couldn't dynamically route, route goods in exactly the same way we do with computer networks. So, from your perspective, you are saying that profitability in logistics can be leveraged by virtue of technology um, and connectivity. Yes, it, it, it basically gives us the opportunity to abstract. We can ship by cardboard box, not ship by shipload. And, and, and historically, logistics has worked on the thing it sits on. So everything on a train travels together. Everything on a truck travels together. Everything on a ship travels together. Well, we have the insight to do that at the micro level of granularity today. So they might just be happening to travel together and branch off at different points. That's that's where it'll get to. And, and that that will allow personalization to a certain degree of logistics transport which is what everyone's looking for in, in, from a customer perspective. Mm. It is quite fascinating because I also see that IT and connectivity is crucial more so in, let's say, in my, in my industry, in the automotive industry. And in particular, if you look at what's happening in the automotive industry, as we do gravitate towards um, EVs, you would start to say, so how's the government going to generate some money? Because they get £28 billion from fuel duty at this moment in time in the UK. So as fuel goes down, where are they going to get that, get that from? The only way, my belief, that the government can get more money is by some degree of um, taxation on usage. Yep. And, and that, therefore, is the car all of a sudden has to become connected from the minute you get into it, then all of a sudden the clock starts ticking. It's picked up by the government and you are therefore charged, let's say, 20 pence from going from you know, Reading to Maidenhead. And, and, and that's how it's going to have to be done because you can't start taxing e electricity because that goes into your house. Yep. And that's only at 5% of VAT compared to 20% as well. So the amount of money that the government's going to lose by virtue of fuel going down and going to electrification is massive. And the only way they can get it back is through technology in the car, talking to, uh, it's essentially, it's, um, it's seamless tolls. Yes. So, 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 so just like where you're saying in logistics, connectivity is the route forward, it has to be so in, I think, in our lives and the whole of mobility, that's going to be the case. And I think that one of the challenges doing it, logistics by nature is global. No one ever ships from one UK to UK. You, you don't do it. A lot of the regulation is national, and I think we're going to see exactly the same challenge in the car world when we're looking at connectivity there, because the way the UK government set it up might be completely different mm. to the way the French government set it up. Even worse if it's both left-hand drive, so let's say an in-Europe and an out-of-Europe left-hand drive countries, potentially with adjacent borders. Are the car manufacturers going to have to support multiple models and multiple modes of that? That's really not a burden you want sitting on your balance sheet if you're a producer. Absolutely. And there has to therefore be some degree of legislation that comes in that is global, whereby you know you move from France to Germany and it's it's all it's all seamless. It has to happen. And, and is, is that is the facility for global regulation does it exist mm. in the car auto industry today no okay. not really i mean it's very you know european centric yes so europe had their own rules but america has their own rules and asia has its own rules so that's that's a, a bit of a problem moving forward you could do something across europe um and i suppose that more more with people movement in cars it is restricted not so really with movement of goods yeah. The, the, the legislation, governmental legislation, and actually getting 
adaptability in product mm. and the core technology to support the adaptability is one of the biggest challenges mm. in logistics because you can't get two different customs agencies to agree <laughs> on anything. <laughs> yeah, by go. nature, they're going to be competitive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Roll on Brexit, that'll, that'll be good then. <laughs> the IT industry has try, been trying to, to work with customs companies for, uh, for, for many years. Um, so we're now going to play a game. Um, it's called the mobility this or that. I'm looking for one word answers, as difficult as that's going to be with my current guess. So I'm going to take it in turns to ask each of you a question. I'm looking for your preference over each of them. So the first one, Tony, mm. because I already know what Adam's answer would be. Tony, would you prefer to cycle or drive? <laughs> okay, so there's a pause then, because it really depends how far the cycle ride is. <laughs> okay, let's say, let's say a five-mile trip. Oh, cycle. You clearly don't live in a hilly area. <laughs> Adam, electric or fuel? Fuel. Netflix or Amazon Prime? Netflix. Analog or Apple Watch? Analog. I can see you at the moment. Uh, Spotify or Apple Music? Spotify. Cash or Bitcoin? Cash. Monzo, or one of the new challenger banks, or a traditional bank? Uh, I would say Monzo. Okay, I'll, I'll let that for a one-word answer. Uh, <laughs> Facebook or Snapchat? Neither. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> um, Tony, when travelling on London public transport, plastic cards or Apple Pay? A plastic cards. Doorbell or ring? I've got a bell, but like a proper big old clanging bell. <laughs> really? <at> the front, <laughs> yeah. There we you have it. You nicked off one of those ships that you had, didn't it? <laughs> the CIO and CTO of massive, uh, massive companies still has an old-fashioned ringing doorbell. There we go. Thank you very much for joining us on, on today's podcast. Um, in part two, I'll take a closer look at how Adam and Tony got to where they are today in their careers. We'll find out the best piece of advice they've ever gotten in their career. Don't forget to like this podcast, subscribe to the channel to automatically get all of our new episodes directly to your device. Thank you very much.